So this is a special episode. Normally, each of my guests bring a idea, and we go around and we each talk about their idea. But this is a special episode for one of my bigger ideas. So we're just going to talk about my idea the whole time about teaching. And I have my friend and his fiance who didn't want to use her real name, <laughs> which is embarrassing for me. And she's a teacher. And then hopefully we'll get some interesting feedback about my idea. And you guys can jump in at any time. So there's a lot of problems with the current educational system. I'm thinking like high school, K through 12 education, not college. Our performance compared to other countries is getting worse. It's sort of biased against poor people and minorities because rich people can afford to take their kids to private schools and they get better teachers, better education overall. It punishes people who aren't born on the right time of year. Are you talking like setting back a year rather than going with a class ahead because they're at that cusp or? Yeah. And it's expensive. Taxpayers don't want to pay enough to make it good and to make it stable. If if you guys have any comments, you can jump in. I'm curious what your idea is. (laughs) I'm actually getting to it really slow. (laughs) I see that. I see that. Um, There's a problem with unions and not being able to fire bad teachers. And then the last problem that I was going to talk about is not keeping up with modern technology. A friend of mine just uh, moved his kids from one school to the other, and now they all, all of his kids that now have iPads instead of books. But I guess a lot of schools still don't have, maybe not iPads, but tablets or laptops of some sort. Hmm. A lot of kids are still using books. See, that's contestable. I mean, <laughs> and we like grew up paper. on books, paper, yeah. pencils, overhead projectors. <laughs> Yeah, but we also didn't date by swiping left or right either, so, you know. So they're finally getting rid of teaching cursive, which I think is a good thing. It's not really used. They're starting to phase out obsolete things. Cursive? Books? Yes. Books well, yeah. and, and cursive. Kids right. can't read cursive anymore. Really? No, you write it on the board and they have no idea what it says. Well, I mean, no. you have to sign, eventually learn how to sign checks and things of that matter. Like, what are they going to do? Get rid of signatures and just have them... They don't even look at that you know, signature on the block check. letter rights. It's just a fake, safe thing, like airport security. It's, it's, GSA. It's just to make people feel safe. No. It's, it doesn't even really matter. I like oxygen masks on an airplane when it's going down. It's just like you're, you're going down. Suck on this oxygen, right? You'll be able to breathe for the few minutes you need. I think that's yeah, useful. But- <laughs> you think that part is useful. But, uh, That's not a fake thing. <laughs> it's I a happen, pressure change thing. I happen to like oxygen personally. Right, right. <laughs> um, so the other example of uh, outdated technology to me is a music class. And I thought this since I was a kid. And I wanted to play guitar or drums, not like marching band drums, but like important real rock drums, you know, like useful. Like a drum kit. Music. Music classes. And I thought it was so stupid that they would teach kids marching band and like I read that they teach people jazz too. So marching band and jazz are the primary types of music education in the United States for uh, school kids. Yeah, but without marching band and teaching kids marching band, you wouldn't have the band kid. We all knew the band kid. Well, it's true. So where would they go? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where they'll go. Because, <laughs> they'll play video uh, games. I read an article on the internet about the Swedish music explosion. ABBA? EDM? Well, yes, and more. But uh, if you Google why is Sweden so good at pop music, basically since like 2012, over half of all top 10 pop songs have been written by Swedes. There's one guy, I think his name is Max Martin, who's a Swede, who writes about half of the hits by like Katy Perry, Kelly Clarkson, Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande. Almost all of those hits are written by him and other Swedes. Sweden is the third leading music exporter in the world behind the United States and the United Kingdom, even though their population is really a lot smaller. And the reason is because, according to this article, 30% of high school students take after-school music programs, and they're given a specific music track, like pop, rock, classical, or mixing slash recording. So uh, they teach them relevant music. And so... Did you just call pop music relevant? Compared to marching band, it's relevant. Well, I mean, like, you are getting the basic skills of playing, like, a reed instrument out of marching band. Yeah, you learn some basic skills, but, you know, it would be better than learning basic skills that can sort of be applied to something useful. Learning useful skills in the first place. People make all these excuses for, like, why these outdated things are still good. Oh, you can kind of use this skill for something useful. 
well, why not just go straight, zoom in on the useful thing rather than making excuses for some outdated thing. But didn't you say that the music program was after school? It's yeah, still funded hop- by the government. They have mm-hmm. like 50% okay. taxes and they're like one of those countries. Okay. All right. So your idea is to completely get rid of marching band-esque type music and just focus on learning how That's to play. That's just a side okay. thing. For example of uh, outdated technology, my idea involves the whole educational system. Okay. I'm sorry. Curious. Um, so before I even get to the idea, so there's been a lot of bad ways to fix schools. <laughs> The government, they try to give different amounts of funding to school based on performance. But uh, there's lots of problems with that because the students aren't a random sampling of students. They're typically of a certain racial background or income background. And so that skews the statistics so much, it's really hard to tell what school is performing good under those conditions. It's hard to separate the signal from the noise. There's too many outside factors beyond the school, home life and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and uh, I never thought it made sense, even as a kid, that they would fund the school as a whole. Because basically every classroom, it's kind of like an independent kingdom. Like, they have a lesson plan, they're going to do it. Their lesson plan isn't going to all of a sudden change drastically because the school got 20% less funding or more funding or whatever. So changing the funding of the school as a whole is not tackling the problem head on. Again, like the band example, it's like they're not going straight for the bullseye. They're just tackling things around the edges. They're not getting to the core of the issues. Like the No Child Left Behind and all the things, they never really work because... It's not a rational way to look at the problem. There's yeah. bad statistics. It doesn't focus on individual teachers and individual lessons. And so another thing that I think sometimes happens is they'll vary the teacher's salary based on performance. Boo. That's true, right? <laughs> that, that's a real thing, right? Yes. It's been done. Not, not in this state, but it does happen in other districts. You get like merit pay if your kids do really well or if you like meet highly qualified or that type of thing. Yeah, generally so, do. So, so as a teacher, your your salary is based upon what this six, seven, eight year old kid does. Oh, absolutely. Or how well they do. Oh, absolutely. Your oh, whole that job. sucks. Oh, yeah. So basically, what you need. Thank to God, do, parenting isn't like that. <laughs> so you need to get him to drop <laughs> out. Work. You need to get the kid to drop out to to adjust your stats to make more money. You know, well, I, I but, think the school fails them, but that is like good. I will keep that in mind. Like, but yeah, there's all sorts shoot. of problems with that. Again, yeah. the sample size for statistics is really small, and it's not random. And same same problems involved in that. And then there's private and charter schools. They try to fix education that way. And uh, basically, they sometimes do better. I saw a John Oliver thing that sometimes they're horrible. Oh yeah. Uh, sometimes they uh, poach the good teachers because they have more money because the rich people are paying more. So it doesn't really improve the educational system as a whole to poach teachers. No, and charter schools can pull kids. Like you have to qualify to get into a charter yeah, school. Like, true. And okay. so it's a self-selecting population where it pulls the kids whose parents are really invested and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And then the, my last point about bad ways to fix schools, a lot of what parents focus on is pseudoscience. Like they care way too much about classroom size. Oh, that's absolutely a thing. Well, obviously, if it's huge, if there's 50 kids, it's too many. But according to, uh, I think I read a Freakonomics article, that if the class is too small, it's not good either. There's a good That's definitely true. midpoint I've had, of like 20 to 25 kids. So, I've had classes where it's so small, I'll ask a question, and the science teacher feeds insects to one of the crickets. And one had gotten out and was in my room, and there was eight kids in the class. I asked a question, and no one knew the answer. And then literally this cricket started going off. It's like, seriously, <laughs> this is this happening right now? Crickets. Yeah, that's not good if you're a comedian either. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Not that that's ever happened to me. <laughs> well, they have that Very show funny. at the recycling center. I think it's outside, right? Uh, Chucky Fenster. Yeah. Yeah. Do they hear yeah. crickets? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've never if done If it's outside, that. I would bet they would. I'm pretty sure they would. So, yeah, visual learning versus book learning. That's a thing that a lot of parents like, oh, my kid's not a book learner. He's a visual learner. That's not a thing anymore. People still say, like, I can't learn like this. And usually our response now is like, yeah, you can. Suck it up. (laughs) But, yeah, so I'm still working up towards the idea. (laughs) I'm really curious what your grand idea to fix education is. It's going to come in like the last five minutes of the show. (laughs) And our time's up. Now solve it. (laughs) So... Basically, what is a teacher, if you think about it? I'm going to separate it into a few job roles. 
One of them is a classroom monitor. So my totally blind, out of nowhere guess is that a quarter of the time a teacher spends is uh, watching kids read or do their assignment or taking attendance or watching them take a test, basically sitting idle and being a monitor. Like maybe you can double up and do other work while they're taking a test. Like Sometimes, a lot of times if the kids are working, you're like circulating and helping. So you're not just watching. Even during a test, you're answering questions. Like I, I don't sit down when so I So you're helping test. them cheat is what you're saying? <laughs> no, no, not helping them Gotta cheat. Get those numbers up. Yeah, exactly. My, my, <laughs> my pay is based on that. No, I don't help kids cheat. <laughs> but you are, you're walking around and you're helping kids and you're like, oh, think about this question this way. And like, oh, you know this, you just need to focus on this. There is a little bit of just monitoring, but usually if I'm giving kids work time, it's because half the kids won't do their homework at home, and so I need to get them working on it in school, or only the kids with parents who make them do their homework are going to start doing homework and start practicing the skill. Okay. Um, But yeah, probably 25%. You are just, uh, that might, I don't know. Instead of actively teaching, you are doing more monitoring type stuff. Yeah. Instead of actually being in front of the classroom. Sure. So, okay, the second role is actually doing the teaching, giving the lesson, writing things on a – do you still have chalkboards or whiteboards? Hell no, we don't have chalkboards. I hate that stuff. Whiteboards? We have whiteboards and mostly I use my document camera to projector. Okay. Like an Epson projector that projects onto my whiteboard. It's crazy, uh, isn't it? Technology, man. And no, no one expects you to we do your We have sticks and stones. <laughs> right. Didn't somebody <laughs> claim that like chalk causes cancer or something? I don't – I sure. If that means I never have a chalkboard again, yes, chalk causes cancer. <laughs> Chalk causes cancer. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, nobody expects you all to do your jobs with technology from 1990 when we all went to high school. <laughs> Just saying. So and as far as teaching, there's sort of two different roles there. One is actually giving the lesson in that it's like a mostly uninterrupted thing. No. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I might, be, I might be wrong on this, but there's a period where you're explaining something and then afterwards, usually kids ask questions. Although, yeah, I suppose they can interrupt it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends, too, on the individual teacher and whether they tolerate that type of thing. Well, not even tolerate it. Encourage it. Try this. We'll do it. So then there's tutoring, which is how I define the after the lesson part, which could be during the actual class or during a study hall period, whatever. So yeah, it's, lunches it's more, after school, that type of thing. It's more one-on-one or group thing. Yeah. Like answering questions that an individual kid has. Okay, so my idea... Finally, is uh, I was gonna say drum roll, please. Yeah. <laughs> First, you fire all the teachers. Hey, now, <laughs> what? And and replace them with uh, robots. So oh. I divided the task the teacher does. The first one was a classroom monitor. You don't need a high-paid person with a college degree and fifty grand student loan debt to be a classroom monitor. You could pay somebody like ten dollars an hour. Give them like a one-week training course. Do a background check to make sure they're not a creepo. (laughs) Um. That's key, yeah. Uh, Can I just interject, though, that classroom monitoring and getting kids to behave is arguably the hardest part of my job. Because you can know and understand how people learn things, but it's a totally different thing to get that kid to stop being a, a jerk to you, essentially. That's a whole other, that's a skill. I'm not saying it's not a skill. It's not a skill that needs... College education? Yeah. So then I'm going to go to the third role, tutoring. So that would be where I would put the good teachers. You would have full-time tutors. So they would make about as much money as a teacher used to make. They would still be fully college educated. What is a classroom size in that case? Are you talking one-on-one when you say tutors or are you adding it Like a study one? hall period. So I'm picturing – again, the, the school could do whatever they wanted. But I'm picturing like a group of kids in a library and then there's like five or six tutors just sort of roaming around answering questions. So there's like 50 kids and five tutors roaming around. So that so classroom size now is 10 to 1. For that for, one okay. study hall for period. For study hall period. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then – For giving the lessons, this is where my idea comes in. Replace the teacher with a multimedia-based teaching system, and I call it Teacher Die. (laughs) The name is based on uh, Funny or Die, the uh, comedic website. So basically, the whole point of the teaching system is the teaching materials that aren't successful will be discarded, leaving the most successful ones to be taught the next semester. 
So you would have this big like nationwide or large group of schools and you'd have a bunch of different companies or individuals all making lessons for the same exact subject matter. And then there would be a, a standardized test for that and you would compare the results that the kids had from company A versus company B. And then based on how well they did, that's how you, for one thing, you would pay the company more based on how well the kids did. And then the next semester or next group of kids, a higher percentage of them would be taught using the more successful lesson. So is the idea to pare it down to one lesson that is the most successful and then use that going forward for all children? You'd never pare it versus, down. You know, versus constantly having two competing companies like an AT&T and Verizon type of thing where they're essentially teaching the same thing, but one might have uh, better scores or, or a better uh, uh, output than the other. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you, you would you would never pare it down. You would always have competition. Competition. So you'd you'd never have like one do more than like seventy percent of the total country. There would always be upcomers rising trying to take their territory for that individual <laughs> lesson. And they would all be treated individually. Like if one Verizon lesson for algebra one for this topic, like fractions or I guess that's not algebra. I don't know. Is I don't know what algebra is actually. Algebra is like Y equals 2X plus B. It's but whatever, equations. whatever lesson it is, <laughs> they, they, they might be successful, super successful in one topic and not successful in another topic. And you wouldn't bias your opinion based on how successful they were in another topic. So it would allow these small startups. You could have like a, a teacher or former teacher who got fired because of my system. They could be like an uber genius at teaching this one small topic. And they could just reign supreme over that topic for 20 years and just keep raking in more money. Yeah, I was going to ask, who's writing all of these lessons from you fired all right. the teachers? <laughs> so you're firing the teachers, but you're creating a whole industry. So there'll be, uh, there'll be some big companies and there'll be individuals. Uh, some of the big companies, that they'll have these like scientific theories from professors, like this is how people learn. So they'll, they'll put those to the test. There's a guy on YouTube. His channel's called Veritasium. He does science things on YouTube. Okay. He's like a PhD in teaching. His idea is that teaching is best done where you ask people how they think it works and then you correct them, something like that. Okay. So it's more complicated than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's all these theories on how teaching works, and sometimes a private company will open a school based on one of these theories, but they never really pit them in the battle dome against each other. But my system would do that, so the best system would rise to the top, kind of like how martial arts, before MMA, there were all these people who thought that like their brand of martial arts was king and that they could beat up all the other people, and it was like in the realm of pseudoscience and ridiculousness. Because there was no actual actual competition. Yeah. And I think that's what teaching is. It, it's in this realm where people can make claims, and a lot of the claims are just stupid marketing tactics. There's no evidence-based feedback system. Yeah. And as uh, you're in tech, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, being in tech, we see the importance of evidence-based feedback in oh. software. There's iterative development. and Absolutely. Uh, refining over time and like the whole philosophy of the internet is rapid fierce competition open competition and yeah uh, that's definitely. that's completely absent from education and education is a weird field where it's totally easy to put it in there it definitely we, because the, the feedback mechanism is simple Kids take the test. Right. It's instant feedback. But anyway, so <laughs> yes. tech is the only industry in the United States which is working right now. Everything else is garbage. It's yeah. getting worse, and it's just ripping people off. Well, like, I don't I, know if I agree with that. Tech's doing that, too, nowadays. A little. They, yeah, they're starting to. Get but, kind of scummy. <laughs> yeah. But, like, other, like, the housing industry is basically unchanged since, yeah. like, the 20s. Just trivial little changes like, oh, they have a new type of vinyl tile for a floor. I think we should have houses that aren't attached to the ground so they can, you can move where the jobs are. And I think there should be big, big changes in housing 
but like everybody thinks so small in non-tech industries. Yeah. Tech is a system that works. It's not tech in and of itself. It's the philosophy of tech. It's that you right. put the dreamers at the helm, not the money managers who are trying to maximize short-term profits. Right. You have these guys like Elon Musk and like Steve Jobs who care about quality. And I think tech is a big shining beacon of what humanity could be. And it, oh, it's not sure. perfect, but and I think the philosophies of tech, the passion and the evidence-based the way of doing things, I, I think there's beauty in that. My system would bring that philosophy to teaching. So let's take this from the other side of things for a moment here. If you were a parent and you are going to send your kids to these schools and you knew that school number A over there has a 70%, the one that was predominant last year, and you know school number B <coughs> over there is one of the alternative schools which is starting to grow, but you're not 100% sure whether that the lesson that they're doing is good or the lesson that other school is doing is good. But everybody seems to go to the other school, and it seems to be pretty successful. Why would you ever send your kids to this riskier school? All of the lessons are random. The school might get a Verizon lesson for this topic, but some other startup lesson written by a teacher for some other lesson, and it'll all be distributed randomly based on like a lottery system. So there's not like one school that's getting the more vetted lessons and the other schools aren't everybody's getting the same mix of random lessons just from different sources different companies are making yeah. like this company might be better at you know geometry this one might be better at trig this one might be better at algebra uh so that's three different companies but one school would get a lesson plan from each of those companies uh but, based upon whatever whatever the highest score is um well, their best scores in those particular subjects. But the lessons won't be a whole class. It'll be like like a lesson would be like a small topic from like one day to two weeks, depending on what makes sense. So even within a class, there would be different companies teaching it over the course of right. the three months. Like you divide like fractions is one thing and then uh, you don't long division is lesson. another thing. So you just jump from lesson. So a, a class is like composed of like 20 to 30 lessons and each one of them would be randomized and taught by a different company. Like in a math class, you do one lesson, you move on to the next subject and you keep mm -hmm. going through. How do you interject new companies to see whether their lessons are better? So there would be some initial vetting process and then you would – teach them to some kids and then see what the test results are. And okay, the test results for this random, and they would be sort of a big random thing across multiple schools. So you would take out the poverty and race and gender differences. All of that would just melt away. It would be a totally random sample. Wait, why would all the poverty and all that melt away? It wouldn't affect the statistics. You would have like 5,000 students amongst 30 schools taking this one test by this one company. It wouldn't be one school. Uh, it's all poor kids. So my, uh, the school I teach at has a wide variety of students who are very, very wealthy. Their parents are professors. They have vacation homes in Europe. And another big portion of my school who are on free and reduced lunch, which means that they – um, their parents are below, make below the poverty level and then have to pay for lunch. So I have both of those in that same school, which means they are getting the same teachers. They're getting the same environment. Everything is the same except what their home life is like. So this idea that it's going to melt away because the – Well, it's not going to solve the problems of the home life, but those problems aren't going to skew the statistics and ruin somebody's education and help somebody else's education. It'd be good data. It wouldn't be bad data, like all the no child left behind and grading the school and trying to weed out how well they did, even though half of the kids are in poverty in this one school, and trying to do math tricks to weed that out of the statistical data to figure out who's doing good and who's doing bad. My system, it's implicit in the system that it weeds it out, all of the noise from the signal. So I, I can see how in very low-income areas, maybe a whole city that's a very low-income city, this could raise the quality of learning across the board that way. But at the same time, I think you're also lowering the quality of learning in some of the areas that have very um, creative and very skilled teachers because I find that most of the teachers that are really good at their jobs don't teach on a level playing field. They actually can find where the weakness is in the student and hone in on that weakness and then teach in a different way, in a more focus to that student. So now – 
what we're doing is we're erasing that focus. And ah, uh, the tutor still does that. Well, yep. the tutor's doing ten kids. The tutor isn't part of my system. The tutor is something run independent of my system. My system is the teacher die teaching materials. Sure, but even with that, with the tutors stepping in and doing doing whatever their role is, they still have to have that interaction with that kid to understand and get a vibe for how that kid learns, how that kid reacts to to certain uh, situations, versus just sitting in a in a study hall waiting for a group of kids to come in. And them raising their hands, you know what I mean? Because that kid might ask a question on one particular thing with that tutor that can help them out with. But as time goes on, that kid, and and you say that the outside environs don't uh, affect what they do in school. Well, it it has to, whether or not they're getting enough sleep, whether or not they're able to learn when they're out, uh, when they're away from home, what are they learning? What are they doing outside of uh, school? And I only say this because I come from a large family. I'm one of 17 kids. So there was wow. constantly noise, and we were dirt poor. But I graduated 17th in my class, and I went to Cornell. I just want to interject that that is insanely impressive, Cornell on 17th in your class. You know what? And that's the whole thing. And I know that it was hard for me to study at home. So I studied at my friend's house. I, I stayed at school later. I went to school early, especially in high school. I was at school at 6 o'clock, and school started at 730 but I went there because it was difficult for me to find the time to carve out the time to learn. Now, I'll also say that I have a very photographic memory. So I never had homework. I did everything in my classroom, but I could visualize the question and the teacher writing on a board and all of that other stuff. That doesn't apply when it comes to reading in English because when you can read it and you can read it over and over again, but to get the understanding, you need quiet and calm and everything. And I didn't always have that. So that's where I'm, I'm having a little disconnect with the system. The system seems to regiment it. It seems to formulaic when there are all kinds of variables that's added to a kid's education. And um, to have a bunch of teachers waiting in a room for a bunch of kids to come in to answer questions, that's cool and all if they have issues with one or two things. But if they're having problems in math consistently, Across the board, now that tutor is going to have to spend a lot of time with that kid Mm -hmm. on a continual basis. So them sitting in a room to learn is one thing. Outside of that room, uh, that's where I'm kind of like, you know, it just kind of gets weird, you know. Um, So one of the things I thought was, well, you're freeing up a lot of money because. Where's that money going to go? Yeah, so you could you could use it for other things. One of the things I thought, well, you could have like full time psychologists to help with the troubled kids, like on campus. You could have more after school programs, which might help more right. like yeah. after school study type things and tutoring and whatever. So there's that. Everyone has a good story about a, a truly horrible teacher that they had. <laughs> I mean, everyone's got one uh, because. Some people are are bad at their jobs. But doesn't right. everybody have a story of, like, an awesome teacher who really inspired you? And- all of my teachers were super awesome. Really? I didn't have any didn't- – honest to God, I, all of my teachers from elementary until I graduated high school. But my attitude was I didn't go to school to get in trouble. I treated school like it was my job. I took a briefcase to school in high school. Oh. I was such a blur. <laughs> I was the coolest blur on the planet. That but awesome. that was me because I treated it. That was my job. But I also knew that my parents couldn't afford to pay for me to go to college. And I also knew that if I screwed up in school, Sam and Rosie Jeter would come down <laughs> with thunder and lightning from both sides and knock me out. And I also had little brothers and sisters behind me. I didn't want them to see me screw up. So I was a gold star kid from kindergarten through, you know, I want to say through high school. I love the kids whose parents were, all you have to say is I'm going to call home. And that kid is perfect from that day <laughs> out. I love you did, your parents. I have several examples of what not to do. And I'm like, I'm just not going to do that. Oh yeah. So I had a pretty easy time in school, but there were a lot of, there were kids. Uh, I have a buddy. It was just, he and his sister and he couldn't get it. Didn't bother to get it. I've known this kid since I was in third grade. It was difficult for him to capture that. So all the tutoring and and, and the attention in the world, and and especially in that situation, his parents were on him, and he just, eh. yeah, it just didn't mean anything to him. So that's why I'm saying, again, the outside environs, it didn't matter what his parents did. He just didn't care. 
Okay. Um, yeah, there's not much you can do about that. But as far as yeah. the, the having the good teacher, you can have a tutor also that you sort of love and you remember as an adult. That doesn't go away. Right. Yeah, but um, someone who's helping you learn something is different than someone who is teaching you the content because I always go with the idea that like enthusiasm is extremely contagious. And if I pass out a quiz, am, am I excited about the quiz? Like, here you go, guys. I'm so – you know, you're going to do really well. Like, kids do better on that quiz. Uh, the uh, – Monitor can also have enthusiasm. See, I the, think you're right. The unskilled you're monitor. Right. But something we're forgetting about here is like trust. I mean, yeah. when you spend an entire year with somebody, you learn who they are. You get right. close to them. Yeah. You start to trust them. And it's not just the, t- the teacher. They become a friend sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then you start confiding. And I get it. You're, you can have the tutors do that too. Yeah. But that means that everybody has to come back to the exact same place at the exact same time. With the exact tutor. But then what are we changing here? Aren't we going right back to yeah. the classroom? Your well, idea seems okay. kind of L- – I, I, I missed a couple things. L- let me try to right, – Sure, yeah. So sorry, sorry. Basically – I don't know how I missed this. But basically what a teacher does, in my opinion, they have a lesson plan and it's usually written by some publishing company. My lesson plans are written mostly by me. Well, you t- teach a weird subject. I don't want to get into that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so – Basically, right. the, the job of the, the teacher does is takes that lesson plan, trims it down because most textbooks have a ridiculously huge amount of stuff in them. Like if the, if you were to assign yeah. like every problem at the end of the chapter to a kid, his head would explode. It would take him like two days to – No, textbooks are kind of terrible. So there's a mismatch between the textbook and the class. So that will go away in my system. Wait, it, why will it go away in your system? Because there is no textbook. So where are kids getting content from? Just well, the, the companies so, you mentioned earlier. Just lectures? Um, no, it's no. Be no. Like so basically it's it's multimedia. And the, they, the company can choose whatever multimedia they think fits the lesson. So it can be a lecture projected on, on the wall. It can be reading material on their tablet. It can be an interactive web page. It can be graphics. So It can be whatever they want. It can be taught by Neil deGrasse Tyson or some scientist, science speaker, or some celebrity or a comedian. Or a good teacher. It, it can be taught using some teaching philosophy that's new that some Stanford professor came up with. All, but in all of it is just – it's going to compete against another company for that same lesson. So so what you're describing is my classroom most days. I think in the past week I've watched three YouTube clips. I have made videos to show kids. Uh, we do some textbook reading. That's a lot of what teachers are doing now. I'm doing a scientific analysis of the test results with a large sample. You can't have a scientifically valid sample size with just in, my classroom. With just your classroom, no matter how good of a teacher you are. Oh, I am an excellent uh, teacher. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, back pad. <laughs> but, but, but basically, <laughs> what most teachers do so they have the lesson plan. They're trimming stuff out, and then they're basically improvising a lesson. And their improvisations are error prone. They're writing things on the board. They're getting math problems wrong. They're skipping important details, maybe. And so all of that will be weeded out in my system because these companies, before they release the lesson, they could have, like, sample test group of kids. They could have people whose only job is to search the teaching materials from the other companies and try to find weak lessons that they think they can out-teach. So there could be this whole infrastructure and also there's continual improvement. So if the test does bad, the next time they teach it, it'll be taught to a smaller sample of kids because some other lesson is starting to overtake it in percentage of where it's being taught. So they can try to improve it and weed out errors. And like if the kids had common questions or they got a certain question wrong in the lesson, the next semester when they teach it to a different set of kids, it'll be improved. So not only is there scientific analysis of the test results and competition, there's also continual improvement and it's built into the system and it's fast improvement compared to like textbooks, like they have a release one, release two, which comes like five or ten years later and it corrects some of the errors. But this is like semester or year basis and I even thought, well, if the size was big enough, you could divide the kids into different groups depending on their birthday so there could be a group of students who's taking the the lesson in the fall and then Mm -hmm. a different group that's taking it in the winter and then there's a different group taking it in the spring 
And so every iteration, the company would get feedback of which kids got which questions wrong, how well it did compared to the other companies, and they would get a chance to improve it. So it would just keep getting better and better and better and better over time. Now, would this be on a per school basis or a national ranking, like the schools in Michigan versus the schools in Ohio? The it schools would all in be random. Be random. Be okay. national. It would be national or as much as national as I could get it. So let's take the continual improvement about students. And, and the, how do you solve the problem where a student just misses a lesson, but the next lesson is going to build off of it? That's yeah. another interesting thing is that the way a traditional teacher is so you give a lecture or a presentation. And if the kid misses it, it's gone. It's out in the ether. They yeah. don't double they back. They don't record it. Right. So, oh, I do. Oh, you do? <laughs> <laughs> I do, yeah. Half my lessons I record and post online, and then the kids have to rewatch it. You should just like ask her it. because she's doing your whole thing. <laughs> I, no, I, I'm just kidding. She already has your plan down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. But, yeah, so my she lessons really would all. She really wants to keep her job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't all... want him in charge. I'm, gonna... <laughs> I'm already doing this. <laughs> they would all be recorded. That makes sense, but, I mean, like, sometimes – I've noticed there's been situations where I've been in a class and maybe because of the students around me who have gotten the lesson, I've been quiet and I've just accepted it. I'll go mm-hmm. home and I'll take the book and I'll have to study and I'll have to figure things out. And it's not hard for a teacher to turn around and say, that kid knows it, that kid knows it, that kid's way off in left field. And so when there's situations where they'll be doing homework There'll be more time spent with that one kid just in that little min- minute to try to boost him back up to where he's supposed to be. A uh, slight thing that comes to mind was in college, I almost missed an entire class because one of my teachers, well, they weren't very good. But the next teacher down the line recognized that half the class didn't understand it and then spent an extra half hour every single class to teach us the previous class as the next class got talked to us. That's invaluable. Yeah. Yeah, that's maybe one thing that maybe isn't addressed in my system, although they could just, if it's on a three... They could still go back to they previous could still lessons. Go back. And, yeah. I mean, that is kind of nice. I could be like, well, I didn't get something last week and see that lesson that went through. And the other thing I thought of is if it's on quarterly semesters, you wouldn't have to hold a kid back by a whole year. You could hold him back for one particular lesson three months. So there wouldn't be the stigma of, okay, you're repeating the second grade. Sure. It could be, you, oh, you're repeating this three-month section of middle school algebra, you know. That's kind of nice. So I hate to break this to you, Tom, but I think the system already exists. There might be something similar. It's called to, Khan Academy. Have you heard of it? Uh, the guy who makes the YouTube lectures with the fake whiteboard. I don't know how his actual academy works. But. Well, the, like – Kids have to do it, and they don't get to move forward until they've reached a certain percent. And then if they get enough wrong, they have to go back and redo it. Does he teach all the lessons, though? I think you know, he I don't, does. I don't know because they've got a lot of different subjects, so I don't, think, I don't think they do. I don't think he teaches all the lessons, but I think Tom is right in this one. He does teach the majority. He started the website. I've been on Khan Academy a couple times. He does teach a large subset of them. It's kind of neat that you can go back and see your previous lessons, and that – shares and aspects of what Tom's talking about. But l- now let me emphasize, before we go, we, we, we got about 10 minutes left, emphasize the value of competition. And I have a couple non-education examples of competition and how it can revolutionize something. And one of them is martial arts. So before MMA came out, there were all these individual martial arts like taekwondo, karate, kickboxing, whatever, And they all claimed to be the best, and they all had these, like, guru guys who claimed that they could do almost supernatural things, like get somebody to uh, faint when they stare them down, or that they could, like, catch a tree that's coming down, or they have these weird, like... I've done those things. Yeah, I was going to say, I I want that fainting when I uh, I stare at someone, they'll come and really help. They can pull their heart out, all these weird things, but... And then MMA came out, and all these different disciplines had to compete against each other. And you found out... What's MMA? I'm sorry. Mixed martial arts. Okay, thank you. So then you got to uh, see what was really good and what really was total BS. And if you took... The heart-beating thing, is that total BS? No. (laughs) Well, actually, they don't... To the unskilled, yes. (laughs) That one might not be testable through MMA because it's probably against the rules to try. (laughs) The still beating heart of your fallen foe. I don't know. But they allow them to do pretty extreme things like snap arms and things, I believe. But no, no beating hearts. No beating heart. You can take this guy's arm and break it in three, but leave his heart intact. But, like, 
That seems legitimate. <laughs> without, without, no. without competition and evidence, any topic is susceptible to falling into stagnation and getting full of BS claims that aren't tested. I think K-12 through education is, is an example of that. Teachers are like nice competitive though like we don't get compensated for what we do if we're better than other teachers but we decidedly get bragging rights and that's worth a lot that pride's worth a lot i uh, bet you if you guys were pulling hearts out that'd be even sweeter that would be pretty awesome yeah <laughs> no one would mess around in that class. i'm just yeah, telling I know. you easiest cow. classroom management ever <laughs> <laughs> so my other example of competition is uh youtube makeup tutorials i saw like a news article about youtube makeup tutorials and there's all these teenage girls who who are making these tutorials and they've Mm -hmm. like revolutionized like what can be done with makeup like uh i saw a woman who painted her chest with makeup to make her breasts look two sizes bigger and do you have a link to that yeah i do actually i don't have it written down (laughs) yes i I need that for my i I was blown away by that and it's like uh and so shall we when you give us (laughs) my thought about that was it probably looks good if you're looking straight at her but probably not from the side so if she's like at a party and she's trying to attract a guy (laughs) as he's walking around the room she'll have to like keep herself so she's looking straight at him so she'll have to like walk sideways so he's always looking at her chest from straight honestly straight thought you're going to talk about the 72 layers of uh, fingernail polish that women are do- well not women are doing but there was a tutorial on it. But any- Never mind. anyway there's yeah, some makeup true. tutorials they can make a person look almost like a different person change the cheekbones the looks of the facial structure and it's really amazing and it's like uh, these makeup companies had all the financial incentive in the world to teach people how to do that to sell more makeup but it just didn't happen. Even the financial incentive of capitalism isn't always enough. You need that competition in the feedback. The competition really makes a difference as to the quality of the thing. So in my system, the competition is built into the system. It's a core part of the system. So my question, though, is in the makeup tutorial, eventually people monetize their YouTube channels, but they're not getting paid initially. They have to first get a following and first be awesome at what they're doing, and then they get the following. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the inherent problems with your system is that people aren't like you've got to make awesome teachers first, and then they can start selling those. Well, they're taking they're watching what other people are doing, even if they're new and they're building on top of that. Yeah, but we already do that. Well, if you really, really care, you do. But again, you're not getting as, as good of feedback because you're not getting the scientific the test results back. This. And you're not watching other lectures of the exact same topic. Go ahead. Uh, I see what you're saying. There is this great website called Teachers Pay Teachers where we all post our favorite lesson plans that have been successful in the classroom. And it's all of our favorite places to go and find new lesson plans because they're well vetted. And then it's also an incentive to make really great lessons. Let's see, I like that. Is we put them all on I Teachers like Pay Teachers. It's an awesome website. Something I do every day. I have to spend an hour editing it and then I can put it up on Teachers Pay Teachers and get some money. But yeah, you could do a similar thing within my system. Like there could be companies that just sell graphics to other companies that make lesson plans, like little snippets of teaching materials. And so there'll be a whole economy based on this. There'll be the uh, presenter of the lessons, the... Uh, People who make the graphics, the people that analyze the lesson plans to see which ones the company should tackle, statisticians who analyze the test results, the companies that come up with the curriculum. and All those things happen in education now. I'm just having a hard time getting on board with you firing all of the teachers. That's kind of how you started this. So but the, I have every incentive to be like, no. Every selfish incentive. Yeah, and every, like... I think she's entitled to that. That's uh, her job. Yeah, yeah it's my okay. job, and it's my expertise. Like, this but is what I'm I do. I'm still trying to figure out the $10 an hour monitors. You know, yeah, you vet them and all of that, but do they have to have any, like, a scintilla, a modicum of educational experience? Or do you just say, hey, this guy can be within 500 feet of the school. So bring, <laughs> bring them in, you know? Uh, you know well, what I mean? There are people in schools who do have that type of job, and they, like all people who are low paid for the work they do, don't They're not going to shovel, right, because they're job. looking at people above them, and now you've created this hierarchy where yeah. they're like, well, I'm just a monitor, and right. you're a tutor, and you make eight times more than I make. I, I'm not going to put that much effort into it. You know what I mean? I think if if you have everyone that has 
well, similar pay scales and they have a little more skin in the game that they'll treat it with much more. Yeah, I do my monitoring job at the same intensity I do my teaching job because I get paid the same amount to do both. Absolutely. Well, I think that well, the monitor doesn't the need path. to do much. I mean, they could lie about the attendance. So I didn't take attendance. Oh, right. Johnny just ran out of the school and he's running through some cornfield and he didn't record that. Where do that. you live? <laughs> Well, we had that when I was a kid. I'm just a regular guy. <laughs> you just watch guy. it out of the window and a kid would be running down a cornfield and then a teacher would like run after them. So a monitor could be on a totally different path. Like yeah. you could hire a guy just doing a $10 an hour thinking they're going to go into, I don't know, uh, culinary arts. And they don't ever want to work hard to become the tutor right. because that's not where they want to go, period. Yeah. We have some really terrible subs yeah. that are just doing time. Right. Oh my gosh, and that's what I'm saying. It, there's no skin in the game for them. So yeah. it's just like I don't care if this kid – really gets it. I'm just here to kind of make sure they're doing something that appears that right. It resembles them learning. Did the kids and murder? I'm anybody? going to push no. it all off on the tutors. So I, I, I'm going to close this off. So th- this is, I think, the only system probably that has competition built in. And I talked about the value of competition it has continued improvement and evidence based statistics built in. I don't think any other system has that. It also, it's the only system that I know of that provides equal quality education to all groups of people, regardless of income, because they're all getting the same multimedia lessons. Obviously, there's issues where, okay, maybe the tutors aren't as good in the poor neighborhood. The family life might not be ideal, but... Those are huge issues. Yeah. I mean, I can't solve the world, but I can provide them the... uh, you poke that stick in that bee's nest. Equal access, <laughs> equal access to the, the lessons is a huge, huge step that probably right. nothing else even comes close. Sure. And this is – it's built into the system. I mean there's been like financial incentives to try to get like good teachers to move to poor neighborhoods and teach there. But they're fighting against the tide because there's no economic system for them to stay there once the economic grant runs out and they still might not want to live in the ghetto or in Podunk, Iowa, where where they're needed. So they're fighting against the tide to get the good teachers there. This, there is no fighting against the tide. The poor kids get the best educational materials just like everybody else. And it's built into the system. There's no need to try to fight against the tide. And uh, let's wrap it up with that. Um, Thanks for coming, you guys. Uh, That was uh, creativity wasted. (laughs) (laughs) I'm comedian Mike Jeter. Gus Nassar. I'm Marie. And I'm Tom Walma, your host. This is Creativity Wasted. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and give a review or rating on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you got it. I have a website, creativitywasted.com, and I also started a Patreon. So if you love the show, consider donating to Patreon. Thanks for listening. You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information.